We've now introduced the government into our circular flow diagram, and we've shown how governments can distort market prices through taxes and subsidies. But there's another way in which governments can distort market prices, and that is by directly regulating them. One such regulation is called a price ceiling, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's when the government sets a ceiling on the price that the market can charge. It won't allow the price to rise above that ceiling. Now, one of the most famous price ceilings in the real world is called rent control. So rent control is a price ceiling on the rents that you can charge for apartments. So here we have a market where we have rental units of apartments on the horizontal axis, and the price of those rental units, which in this case would be the monthly rent, on the vertical axis. In an unregulated market, we'd of course end up at the equilibrium price and quantity. But what if the government sets a price ceiling? Now, if the government sets that ceiling above the market price, it won't have any effect at all, because the market doesn't want a price above that ceiling, and saying it can't price above a ceiling that the market doesn't actually want to reach doesn't have any impact. So the only way that a price ceiling or a rent control has any impact in the real world is if it's set below the equilibrium price. So suppose the government sets rent control or the price ceiling on rental units at this level. Now what will happen in the picture? Firms or landlords will want to supply this many units of rental units. So this will be the quantity supplied. But consumers at the lower price want to demand more rental units. So the quantity demanded by consumers will increase. So now we have more people demanding apartment units than are being supplied by landlords. And that's a shortage. But that can't be an equilibrium. It can't be an equilibrium for a bunch of people to want apartments and not be able to get them. Something has to determine who gets which apartments. So I'm going to call this a disequilibrium. shortage. We are not in equilibrium at this point. Something has to happen. Now, the most likely thing to happen is that all these consumers who want rental units but can't find any are going to engage in additional effort. So, consumers or households will engage in effort to get the limited number of apartments. That effort can come in various forms. It could be that there is a local official that you can bribe so that you can get into one of those units. So in that case, the effort would be the bribe that you pay. Or it could be that you have to do a lot of searching get on a lot of waiting lists, wait for a long time. And that effort is costly to consumers. It's an opportunity cost. Now, when we impose additional costs on the consumers or the households who try to get into these rental units, it's just like imposing a tax on them. It'll cause them to be willing to pay less for those units than they're willing to pay before, because now they also have to figure into their total cost of renting the units the effort cost it takes to get into those units. So just like with the tax, if you were willing to pay this amount before, you're going to be willing to pay less if you have to exert a certain amount of effort, pay a certain bribe, or whatever the case may be. So we should see the demand curve shift down. And as the demand curve shifts down, the equilibrium price that would have emerged had there not been a price ceiling is going to start falling. And we're not going to reach equilibrium until the new demand curve crosses at the number of units that are actually being supplied. Once the demand curve sits here, then this is in fact an equilibrium price. The price ceiling becomes the equilibrium price because consumer-induced effort has lowered the demand 
for those rental units. We can even quantify in this picture how much the effort cost is for those consumers who get into those units. It's the vertical difference, just as that vertical difference was the per unit tax in our tax example. So this vertical difference here is the equilibrium effort cost to get into one of those apartments. So now we again have a very cluttered picture. So let's unclutter it in a lower picture and again only take what it is that we actually need. So we have rental units on this axis, the price for rental units, so the monthly rent on this axis, our original demand and supply, and the original unregulated market equilibrium where this is the rental price and this, un this is the number of units that are being transacted in the market. So now, what do we need from up here? Well, we need to see where the price ceiling is. So here's our price ceiling set by the rent control policy. And then we know that the equilibrium is going to happen here once the demand curve shifts. But instead of shifting it, let's just put that equilibrium effort cost in. Now we can ask who is actually paying what and who is receiving what. The firms or the landlords are receiving the price that's set by the price ceiling. So this becomes the price that the firms receive. But the consumers or the households are actually paying a higher price once you include the cost of the effort that they engage in to get into these limited numbers of rental units. How much additional do they pay? Well, if we spread that effort cost over the time that they actually occupy those apartments, that equilibrium effort cost is this vertical distance. So that actually becomes the price that consumers or households pay. Now, that's an odd result. Rent control policies are put in place in order to make housing more affordable. But this picture suggests that while firms will receive lower rents, those who end up in those apartments will actually end up paying more if we include the opportunity cost of what it takes to get into those apartments. So a natural question that emerges is, why would any government pass such a policy? It would seem to make landlords worse off. They get lower rents. They supply fewer apartments. And it would make, seem to make consumers worse off because they're paying higher rents once you include the opportunity cost of getting into those units. Well, there are some real-world complications that don't appear in this picture. One of them is that when the government imposes a rent control policy, there are already people who live in those units. So the people who live in those units benefit from the rent control policy because they now get a lower rent that they have to pay. They don't have to engage in any effort to get into those units because they're already there. So they do benefit. It's only over time when those units turn over in the market, when people leave those units and new people try to get in, that those efforts, effort costs materialize. So when we get in class, we'll look at a little bit of the empirical evidence to see what actually happens in the real world when these rent control policies get passed and whether the effects that are predicted in this simple model actually show up in the real world.